Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Inno Energy, for the invitation. Regarding my, my presentation, it will be very simple. I won't bother you with too many slides. Feel free to disturb, to interrupt, whatever you wish. If you have any doubt, if you don't understand anything, just let me know, just raise your hand. And please burn my 15 minutes at will, okay? So, let me tell you something about these five topics, five stories. Uh, first, I would like to speak something about price. Price is always something very funny. People always speak a lot about price. And I still remember the, the old times where we used to have feed-in tariffs all over Europe. And in my company, we were kind of happy discussing if something was cheap or not cheap, or some, some wind farm or some solar PV panel was costly or not. Anyway, it's always very picky. It's very hard because people say two things about renewables. Some people say they're expensive, the others say that it's, they are cheap. And I must tell you, I agree with both of them, because they are right. Some technologies still could be cheap, and other technologies could be expensive, depending on the layout, on the mix that you can define for that such, uh, such project. So we should be careful, especially because of this topic here. The final price that people like ourselves pay to people to, to, at our homes, at our companies, really mark your agenda, you really are sensitive to it. And, and especially politically, it's very sensitive. Let me tell you a story. Some, some years ago, I was invited by a, I won't say the name, but a big political party in, in the country to, as independent to try to help them on, a, they call it a study cabinet. Of course, the study was already made, of course, but well, they say, well, let's study some topics on renewables. It was funny because the country was already in crisis. It was like 2011 already. And still people, or most of the group was still saying, let's pursue even bigger targets, let's increase the feed-in tariff. I said, but I was telling that it's crazy. If you do so, you'll destroy the, the, the sustainability of the system and people will start saying bad things about renewables. And they are still good, of course. You should be careful. And still, though, they were saying, no, no, let's go because we need this. It's, it's a good push. So we really should be careful. And we should defend the right technology on the right time for the, the right uh, market. Okay? So, should be very careful with this. Even though, if we see prices, what happened to prices on the last 30 years, it's amazing. Just look at wind. It went down 22 times on 30 years. It's amazing. Let's see solar. It went down by a factor of 150 on 30 years. So this means, of course, that this one is less mature than, than wind, of course. So much more will happen on the next decades at least on the next 10 years, for sure, on solar. We'll see many, many more innovations and more breakthroughs on this, okay? Also, when we compare nowadays, people speak and, and say, well, should we need a feed-in tariff, uh, a fixed value that people pay for our energy? The state has to pay this for 20 years, for example, that it's costly still, and it's sometimes not sustainable by the countries. Or are we already competitive with the market, with the other technologies in the real market? We call it the spot market. As you may know, in, in Portugal and Spain, we have an integrated market. So we have something called Iberian market. It's Mibel. We have a common market. And today, if you look at the prices on wind, for example, you could go down to 26 euros per megawatt hour. This is really good. This is really low. This is almost the amount that you could pay at, at your houses. Up to 51 if you have a worse spots with, with less wind or something else that it's not that, that competitive. Even solar goes already down to 37 euros per megawatt hour. This is huge. This is amazing. This is really low. This is highly competitive already. And up to 45 euros. So something really interesting is happening. We are already competitive today with other technologies. But people still say that they're expensive. So we should try to study a little bit more and try to understand. So this company, Lazard Consulting, has, has made a study which is, is very interesting. And here you really see this is all renewables, and these, these are conventional technologies. We can see that wind, this is wind, large-scale wind and also large-scale solar, are already within the envelope and even more competitive than the most or the cheapest technology, which is combined cycling. So we are more competitive today than, than gas, which is amazing. It's really amazing. So, and here we have all the others, but we pushed so much technology, has, has, has been so much pushed and, and, and really forced somehow to, to reach this value that really we are super competitive today. We can go down to 30 euros per megawatt hour. 
which is really interesting. So what I see here is that we have already technology or renewable technology competing for real on the, on the market. And this is the gross market. This is a spot market. Okay. Let's see now. This is the price, the Portuguese price or the Iberian price for last, for last Friday. I just took it out of Ren's uh, website. So these are real market prices. And here you can see this is the, the cap and floor of, of wind, cap and floor of solar. What you can see here is that we have already gross margins. Even if you consider the, the most expensive values of each technology, wind and solar, you have already gross margin to make if you sell energy on the market, which is quite interesting. So nowadays, you don't really need to ask governments to pay you a feed-in tariff for 20 years, for 15 years, like we used to ask, let's say, 15 years ago, which was kind of critical because without feed-in tariffs, nobody could start a project because the bank wouldn't even finance now I'll speak a little bit about this after, but without project finance and without long-term uh, PPAs or, or feed-in tariffs, nobody would even think about giving you money for your project. And today, you can say, okay, but I can take market risk, I can go and sell my energy directly to the market. It's amazing. Okay, so conclusion for this, this means nowadays that you have to optimize all your layouts, all your technology, all your investments, your grid connections, everything you have to optimize. Investments, so cost per megawatt invested is, is, has to be optimized. Operating, operating costs, OPEX costs must be also optimized. Balance of park, grid connection, everything should be really optimized. 15 years ago, we used to optimize to get more income because we were, uh, were already at home, let's say like this, with a feed-in tariff. It was good enough. It was really disgusting. <coughs> Optimizing was just to, instead of 20%, getting 25 or 23 but nowadays, with this, with this situation now, you should optimize to survive or not survive. If you can optimize your layout, your project, you really can go and develop your, your project in the market and finance yourself. If you fail to do so, you're just out of market. You cannot finance. Nobody will lend you money for this. Okay? But this is a new situation that we have here. Because now we see in the newspapers and in magazines people saying, well, it's not enough the spot market to pay our energy, but I can show you, it is. It's, these are real data. Okay, this is, is real. You can see on REN, REN website and the calculation are quite easy to, to perform. Okay, topic number two. This is a huge thing. Nobody thinks much about this. I was a dispatch engineer on ADP some, let's say, 15 years ago at least. I'm not sure if everybody knows what is a dispatch engineer. engineer. It's somebody that is like a Traffic, a real traffic controller. So it's like two persons here in Sakavai, near Lisbon, that are controlling in real time all the generation of the country, both for transport energy and also for generation. So we control water, uh, thermal, and all the, the large power lines in terms of distribution of the country and transport and distribution. So it's a huge responsibility. And of course, those two persons have to balance all the energy that is generated in the country. Whatever you generate and you don't consume means that you're injecting on Spain. And as you know, our grid now is connected until Ukraine. So it's a, it's a huge network and you have to balance it. In theory, you have to have zero balance between countries, between cross-border. And of course, renewables have a problem of volatility in terms of uh, production. But normally, people think only about one volatility. It's production, about capacity. Wind goes up and down on the same day. But they, it's two. So we have daily basis volatility because if I tell you tomorrow I'll produce 500 megawatts hour with my, my wind farm, but tomorrow could be no wind. So we have a daily basis, volatility, but also if I have already the turbine on, on, on the grid, wind could, could shift for half of my, my production. So I could lose power down to zero or to the minimum technical power. So it means that it shifts also interdaily. So we have two types of volatility. And this brings a big, big challenge to people that are trying to balance and to keep the stability of the whole system, not, not of a single wind farm, but all of it. All of the, the loads, all of it together. Okay? And this brings a real impact on the rest of the, the generators. For example, large generators on, on Sinj, Stubal is not in commission anymore, but, but uh, Turbogage in the north, generators with 300 megawatts, they were not made to get inside and outside the grid every day. I still remember when I was in EDP, we had like something like Annex 8 was like the, the technical operative uh, data to manage all these this, this generators. 
and we, we had a restriction. We could not take them out of parallel more than 50 times a year. Do you know how many times they go out per year now? They go all days. Every day they go out, in and out, in and out. And why was the 50 times restriction? Because Siemens by then was telling us, if you take them more than 50 times, we don't guarantee them anymore. So we have to pay more on O&M costs. So costs would increase for this. It's, uh, so this is a real impact. Nowadays, every night, my colleagues have to take these generators out of the grid, and by 6.30, 7 a.m., they have to put them again, which is tricky, because the, those are big, bulky units. They are not made to get inside and out, inside and out every day. This is not like that. They were kind of base load generators, okay? Another impact. For example, Portugal is very small. Normally, if wind fails in one wind farm, it's more than, than, than likable that it will fail in more wind farms in a region in the north, in the, the center, in the south. This means that many megawatts could drop or increase in, in like two minutes or even less, in some seconds sometimes. This poses a huge problem to how can I stabilize my system? Because then you start having flows. And nobody wants to have flows between countries unless you are selling or buying energy. Okay, so, so this brings new challenges that, of course, who is going to respond if, to them? It's the dispatch centers. If each country have to try to balance all of this challenge. Of course, they cannot do it alone. They can't control as long as they have assets that can enable them to control that type of volatility. So here, I see a good opportunity to, to assets that are really capable of providing such regulation. They call it ancillary services or tertiary services. It means that if you have assets in the future that are able to regulate power <laughs> capacity, you'll be able to, to have a double income model. So you can sell energy, plus you can sell regulation services. And sometimes they're badly best, best paid than all the, the energy that you could sell. So it's a good opportunity now because these imbalances will be more and more uh, likable in the future because we'll have more renewables and storage is still an issue. It will be my next topic. But So this is a challenge, but at the same time, it's an opportunity to develop assets that are really uh, uh, load variable and they have that capacity of, of being variable, okay? Also, it's, oh, it's not the next one. Next one is more important, even it's, it's financing. So this is a big topic also. So 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it used to be easy to get money. Cash was not king. I still remember some guys were almost begging, some investment banks, begging for us to explode 50 million, 60 million was like, cash was easy, it was really damn easy. I used to tell, around the globe that you, I had, I never forget this. People still laugh about this for sure. I used to say that I had illimited access to credit by then. And these were back in 2006 and seven. And it was really truth, I was not lying to them. But nowadays it's ridiculous, nobody has illimited access. So we have a fact now to consider, it's the end of easy money, there's no easy money anymore. So we have to be really competitive to get money. So leverages about 97, 90, 10% project finance schemas, they're, they're not, in place anymore. In Spain, I won't tell you the bank, because you, you know the bank for sure, I used to leverage at 120%. So with one project, we could even get financed to other project without equity, which was amazing. So this was on the, on the back 2006 and seven years. So all of this easy cash is gone, really gone. So now we have another problem is we have to finance long-term assets because a wind farm lasts for 20 years at least. So it's a long-term asset. And you have non-stable cash flow incomes now. So the feed-in tariff is, is dead already in Europe, most of the countries. And now we have spot markets, means it's like the stock exchange, the, the price goes daily or intradaily. It, it goes up and down. We have green certificates in some countries that also are subject to, to market. So in some countries, like in Australia, for example, I had double volatility in the, in the market. So I would make my money out of energy and green certificates. And every day the price was fluctuating, so I was never really sure about this. Now imagine going to the banks asking money, millions for this. When you have such fluctuation, they don't like it, of course. Really, they are not really happy with it, they're they not used to it, because they were really preferring the feed-in tariff schema, because they knew already from now to 20 years how much you're going to get paid for your project. So people, of course, were really ready to help you in such conditions. But now with volatility, it's a mess. They won't really help you unless you can mitigate the risk, really. Plus, then this, we have a new context also. We have increased risk 
globally. So we have, you see it every day, more pressure, more risk. Risk analysis now is really the topic, it used to be value, now is risk more than, 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 than anything else. Now you have regional conflicts, so we have two crazy guys now that threaten each other every day with nukes. It's not common, I was not used to this before, not even with the Russians. Terrorism, we have everything now. So risk on the projects really increases, increases even more. Now. Okay, so it's more, more and more challenging to, to get money now. So this also makes you get more sophisticated. It means that all the mechanisms for financing our projects should be more and more complex, more and more sophisticated. Now, you get new ways of financing like leasings, bonds, green bonds, for example, crowdsourcing even, some, some wind farms are, are being financed, small ones with crowdsourcing, it's amazing. People are getting to, to buy, buy their own assets near the, their houses. Okay, also this brings more sophistication on the players. Banks are not suitable for this type of risk anymore, at least most of the banks. So we have to get new ones. And here goes guys like business angels, venture capitalists, corporate VCs like EDP Innovation, for example, in private equities and others. So we have to bring this type of risk to whom knows how to manage this and to understand and to how to evaluate it. It's the only way. And really business angels now and, and VC are trying to, to catch a big part of this market. And the banks are really out of it, at least in my, my view. Okay, even the business models should be arranged that you are strong enough to get money for, from these uh, entities. If not really, it's, it's, it's a disaster to get cash for finance, because still is cash, but only for very good projects. If you have a good project, you really need cash, okay? Another challenge, storage. This was like the old mech of energy, St being able to produce energy and to store it uh, somewhere so that you could develop it and, and really bring it again to the grid later. But this is really getting mainstream. From, just see the, the, the installation values in 2012, it was just 0.34 gigawatts. This year we'll close with almost six gigawatts installed of storage. Within 22, we think that we'll have 40 gigawatts of installed capacity on, on storage, which is really amazing. What's happening is the imbalances due to renewables, now so the technology is evolving so much that really we have two technologies that are really getting closer and closer to mainstream, which are flying wheels and batteries. More and more we see companies trying to get funds to develop. I had a meeting two weeks ago with some Irish guys that were kind of raising nine million for a new technology with flying wheels. And they're really going for this on, on the utility scale, not on domestic scales, okay? Other thing we have to see now, especially with the batteries, is total cost of ownership. We must know that an asset like a battery is not lasting 20 years. Probably five, six, seven, we have to replace the batteries if we keep this technology. Okay. Okay. So still we have money to, to, to get from out of this business. Here we have the, the difference. Again, the prices for, for last Friday for the market. You can see that the difference of price between off-peak and peak is huge. We have big spreads. So it means that we can make money out of this, okay? So if you can sell energy, if you can store energy here and sell it here, you make a lot of money. So this is a huge opportunity to, to who is able to invest on this type of technology in the, in the next years. Finally, some trends. I have no time anymore, so I have to close in the next minute, but just let you know at least some of my thoughts about this. So the, the, the world global energy demand is getting more and more electrical. We see electricity all over, not anymore only on cars, but on trucks, planes in the next decade, they say, boats probably, so even space shuttles would be electrical. So it's really getting electrified, all the energy demand. Okay, also we'll see multi-technology convergence. Some years ago, people were speaking about smart, smart grids. I think it was just a concept by then. Nowadays, I really believe with IoT, with artificial intelligence, with all the digitalization of business models, I really think can bundle all of this together and create new models and really get money with this, okay? Also, solar PV will get really the mainstream on, on some, some markets, at least on, with, with some sun. Costs will go down more 40% on the next decade. This means that we'll get cheap solar energy for sure, okay? Energy storage will get mainstream also, as, as I said, and also drones, and I'm, I'm a mentor for a project of, of drones in inner energy, will be really, uh, helping people not, of course, to produce energy, but to improve and to decrease the risk of the projects and also to decrease O&M costs, for sure. So this will be a, a big trend to see. 
So we'll get more electricity all over us. It will be more and more critical, the price of energy and the electricity for all the families. And if it's critical for people, we'll be more and more strategic for countries. And this will bring no, more challenges and more pressures, I, I believe, between countries and, and regions, for sure. We'll see you in the next years. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for, for that. <laughs>